So routine is something that when I first got started teaching, I thought that, um, so I was very enthusiastic and I could use magnetism and I could use enthusiasm to create magnetism. Um, so I would have the kids go along with what we were going to do next by sheer, you know, magnet, like, okay, everyone, this is what we're going to do next or make it sound fun. Um, I diverted things and I, I wasn't in touch with as much as deeply. I'm exaggerating it for, per, you know, for us to be able to feel it. Um, I wasn't as in touch with what was actually there for them. And I wasn't also allowing their energy to help um, have the classroom flow. I felt like if I had a routine, I mean, I had a general routine, but I felt like if I had, if I had to go from here to here to here, that then I couldn't do flow learning. I couldn't do, um, I couldn't be in tune with their energy. See, it's just opposite of what I just said, but that's how I felt. I felt like I couldn't be in tune with their energy and understand um, where we needed to go, what we needed to do next, if I had a routine that I felt like I had to stick to it. Nine o'clock we do this, at 9.15 we do this. Mm. So it's not that kind of routine. I mean, what I figured out after the first year of exhaustion, I would come home and be laying on the couch um, and that, uh, talking with Usha, who is like, very patiently showing me how um, routine is possible to have in class without losing the ability to be with children and what's happening. Um, I, I learned that routine is what actually created a sense of confidence. So today, Helen and I are going to just kind of touch on a few, a few things here. Um, and I wanted to give you guys kind of the outline of what we would go over. So we're going to talk about routine. We're going to talk about um, connecting with the children. Um, who's the conductor of the classroom? We're going to talk about transitions and we're just gonna talk about some other basic things that we've kind of picked up along the way, some, some um, gems, if you will. And having that as an outline allows your brain to now know what the structure will be. Our brains like to predict what's going to happen, and so when I can have um, when I can have that prediction for them, then now they have security. Now they have the children have the ability to just be with what's happening because they know what's going on. And security gives that ability then for their hearts to be open, and and now they can actually look around. They can interact with their peers. So routine is more about uh, creating a sense of security for the children in the classroom. Um, and Helen, I wanted to see if you wanted to add to that, um, just because we had a great conversation about routine. Uh, yes, um, I, think, I think routines are really your absolute best friend you can have. It just basically eliminates behavior problems, I would say by 75%. And kids look for patterns, repetitions, they know what's coming next. And that helps us then, uh, as an example, um, when we ring the bell, because transition is another thing where people, where kids can get out of hands and it's sometimes hard to hold them. Um, we ring the bell and then they know, oh, it's time to clean up. And if the shining star who is the leader that day, they will start doing it because they know that is what comes next. They're all the, your little helpers. So if you need to help some other child um, to leave the room because that child had a really bad day, the kids will keep doing a morning circle by themselves while you're gone. And so, yeah, routines are just your absolutely best friends. Lifesaver. Yes. That's right. Thank you. Okay, everybody bring a stuffy today. Everyone has stuffy? Okay. So I think today we've all had a chance to, you know, um, perhaps you've had a chance to meditate, perhaps you've had a chance to feel connected just from the beginning of class. Um, have you ever had a child in class that is, they've just, maybe you're introducing something new and the whole class is kind of, you feel that resistance, you feel that stopping. Uh, maybe today you ran into here into your computer and you clicked on the link and you're just barely here. Maybe that happened for you today and maybe you didn't have a chance to be present and be 
um, open-hearted. So one of the things that, that I discovered about stuffies is if you'll all take your little stuffy and just snuggle it in somehow and just really like get connected with your stuffy for a minute, maybe think of a name for it. I said it because I don't know if it's a he or she. Um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, Ducky, even though it's my chick, this is Ducky. And um, when we did virtual uh, teaching, when we were taught over Zoom, everyone, all the children had their stuffy and I had this, what's happening in your body when you're, when you're snuggling with your stuffy? Does anyone have, what's happening? Just throw out some words. Relaxing. Happy. Relaxed. More so open hearted. Cool. Yeah. Safe. I'm absolutely overjoyed at seeing everyone just snuggling their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And, and that's the thing of it. So it actually reduces, or it actually um, emits oxytocin in our system. So a stuffy is, is a tool that can be used anytime, anywhere, even, even high schoolers, right? Even adults, like it's, it's good to have that feeling. And a stuffy is a safe way to be able to get back to open heartedness. Um, you know, we have, we've had children in the class that um, maybe they had sensory issues, but they weren't able, maybe they stayed mostly in their intellect. And so we had what would be considered like they wouldn't cooperate with the, it had a hard time going from one thing to the next thing. And giving them a stuffy gave them the ability to be present to what was happening, to feel safe, and to be able to go along with the routine. This year, I had all of the students, um, all of the kids would go get a stuffy because I stepped in halfway through the year to teach a new class. They all went to got, get a stuffy to do our first morning circle. And then we stayed with doing stuffies in our morning circle because it became, it became so much fun. However, it allowed them to put their guard down and have their stuffy be present with them to be able to do it, um, made all the difference. So I, I wanted to encourage everyone to have, try stuffies. Um, and then one more thing before I turn it over to you, Helen. Um, so do you have a scarf or do you have a blanket handy? So many times we do, at the, for our circle, at the end of our circle, we do um, a yoga pose. We always have, children have jobs. And so one of the jobs is the yoga posture of the day and they get to do that for us. And then that leads us maybe into a few more postures, but we always end our day in child's pose. And if you all have space to stand up right now and to go get into child's pose, take your scarf with you. Um, then get into child's pose and put your scarf over you. And if you don't have space to get up and go do that, put your body into like a comfortable position and then just cover yourself with your scarf and just take a second, take a big breath and just experience what's, what is it, how would you feel under that scarf? what is coming up for you and just think about inside what's happening the sensations how it feels okay um we can come back and normally i would uh so the children when we end in child's pose, uh, many times they're still wiggly. They're, someone's having a hard time staying in child's pose. So when we get out the scarf, um, they love it so much that they, they will, and these are four-year-olds, three-year-olds, um, that they will flip over, get into child's pose so they can have their scarf on. And it, it feels safe to them. They, they can go inside themselves and they can be there. It's a very meditative for them. Um, I had, a, I had a Zoom session this year where the, my internet went down. We had just gone into child's pose. We just put our scarves on. And I always, I always um, have them visualize all their cares and all their worries going down into the ground, down into the ground. I had just finished that. My Zoom session stops. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, it's three weeks in. So I'm a little panicked, trying to get it back connected. Finally come back. It's been two minutes. Guess what? The Zoom call for them hadn't ended. 
they were all still down in child's pose and they had their scarves over them. So I came back to the call thinking that I'd lost them. And I come in and I said, okay, everyone. And all of a sudden, and I was a little frazzled, right? And they all come up out of their scarves and they said, that was so great. <laughs> you know, they were, that was so peaceful. So um, just using, using things like that, that allow that emphasize, um, and, and I am obviously in the physical years, but every person um, in our balance, in our learning, I see the physical years as, um, you know, if you, if you never learn to stand, it's, it's not possible to walk probably, I'll, I'll say probably because I'm in the world of possibilities, but um, physical years are all about that, I think. So, um, okay, Helen, I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, Trina. And what Trina was explaining pretty much happened to me as well. Uh, I didn't have a real routine and I spent so much time every day preparing the next session the next day. And by the time the kids were gone, I was exhausted too. So routines is really your very best friend. And, um, and then of course, over the years, you have all little tricks to help you with classroom management. Um, I want to go into transitions and transitions. Uh, what helps is sometimes a little bell to announce what comes next. So usually for cleaning up, we use the bell and the kids get to wing in whoever is the shining star that day. And they know how to clean up and um, that is really helpful. Um, Sometimes you, not, you might need, uh, if you have a difficult, difficult class uh, in circle, I do name tags so that certain kids get to sit together. So I well thought out seating can be eliminating quite a few problems as well. Of course, well-planned lessons and your own clear understanding of it really is helpful, although Sometimes with your best intent, you have planned everything, nothing can go wrong. And that's usually when it happens. So I went to Michael's, got this really nice, expensive card boards with beautiful colors, cut them just the right side, had 10 kids, put them out on the tables with scissors and glue and papers, like beautifully laid out, nothing can go wrong. We are just finished the story. And I tell the kids to go to the tables as usual. And that's in the beginning of the year. It's a new project that I'm trying out. I turn around to help someone. And it's a little bit longer than intended. And by the time I turn around, the kids are cutting my nice, expensive cardboard with the beautiful colors and gluing and creating. And I'm just like, uh, where they just cut it, that's why I wanted to fold. I had this beautiful product. And there's two choices, right? Um, because now you're a little bit frustrated because you spend a lot of time prepping and here they're cutting and so forth. The good thing is they're having so much fun. So I don't want to be a joy killer, so I'll join. I'm like, whoa, look at that, that nice cut thinking that's why I wanted my fault. And, you know, you just go with the flow. And then for the next day, really basically it was my fault to have it all set out and not have had clear explanations what's gonna happen. So the next day um, we go to the table and that's when I'm giving out the court board and the scissors and explain exactly what comes next. So it was my own fault to have done that. So in the end, so well uh, thought out transitions, um, seeding can help eliminate problems, uh, planned lessons and know how to be flexible is really helpful. And then of course, education for life principles in uh, well planned lessons is, is the best and have a create a balanced structure between movement and sitting still or do individual activities, group activities. And it can be really simple. Um, you know, you paint and sometimes just, 
you have your own sheet of paper where you paint, or you might want to do a, a group activity, one big sheet where everybody paints on it. So all these things are helpful. And then of course comes the teacher has to be in charge. And you don't want to be the sage on the stage. You want to be the guide on the side. And, um, and still, and again, it's, it's something that I think every young teacher should be able to stay with a teacher that had a lot of practice, just makes all the difference in the world. Some things are just cannot be taught, but when you are in the classroom, you can pick it up. So I think really every young teacher should be in a classroom for a year or more. Uh, it does take a while and would make their lives much easier when they're on their own. The teacher has to be in charge. Um, I do tell the kids, it's not just that you have to come in circle because I want to order you around. It's that I cannot teach if everybody does what they want at all times. So it's that I need everyone here. And when we ring the bell and it's circle time, and um, there is a person that is still playing, so then, and I know that person, that child very well, and I know uh, there will be a confrontation. So um, I'm like, hey, Emma, did you hear the bell ring? Yeah, I said, it's time to clean up. Yeah, but I just need to put that on and that and that. I'm like, I understand, that's really hard, but the bell rang, we need to go to circle. Yeah, but I just need to put my head on. I'm like, well, Emma, remember, um, we need to put it away right now. Otherwise, we lose the privilege to have it for the day. But that's no problem. You get another chance tomorrow. And then, you know, she's listening because she knows that's what's going to happen. Uh, but is still not quite willing to part with it. Then uh, in our classroom, which I think is very helpful too, especially for those kids, that just can have such a hard time to separate from the toy. We have a safety spot where everybody gets to put their creations there. Nobody else gets to touch it. And then later on, they can have it back. Another thing that I want to share, and I don't know if other people do that, it's a Montessori thing. I call it um, stations. And um, Stations for me is a little lifesaver. So it's usually in the end of the day when the kids are getting a little bit more tired to compromise one more time. I'm getting a little bit tired and it's really the last 50 minutes. When after the art or whatever uh, math we do that day, we have probably another 35 minutes to go before, go before we go home. And station is, I make it really simple. You could set it out but I let the kids to choose. So they know what they get to choose. So they can choose a toy, um, a game. They can take out the little sandboxes. They can have the beads. And with station goes silence. So we do not talk. And sometimes the kids need it, but sometimes I really need it. I just need quiet in the classroom. And they are quiet for, 20 minutes you want, you come in here and it's just silence. And you do get to change. So let's say you get tired with the sandbox and you want to play somewhere else. You can get a new toy that nobody's playing with, but you cannot go to a station where the child already has the wanted toy. And the Montessori says that the first 20 minutes you go in maybe that much and it really helps you um, settle and focus and then you come out of it. However, the second time it's said to be 40 minutes, they come out of it and then, so it's a little noisy, they talk and you have to remind them to be quiet, re-emphasize and then do it again and then they go deeper this time in focus. And um, Montessori has created for kids that are running, um, that don't have any structures um, in Italy for kids that just can't focus, that never had any routines, that do what they want all day long. 
Um, could you talk a little bit more about transitions? I know uh, you, you touched on it a little bit in terms of like when you have a student that just, but I have to, I really need to, you know, um, or, or just as a class, you know, the timing sometimes, you know, there's just when we're trying to get in academics or different things or we need to go to this place or do that. Do you have any, any or Trina, either of you, any suggestions on um, tricks, techniques, tools to, to help transitions be really smooth? Yeah. Um, after circle, uh, when we just come out of prayer and so forth, and we go into journaling, it's just loud. And I let them because they have been really concentrated and quiet. So I give them five minutes to be loud, run around, and I wait until I have their attention again. And then we have a focus that it's physical. We, we do something with our hands. They get to walk around. So I do let that but transition in the end of the day Usha um, years ago she said if you want parents to be on time you have to be on time Helen and so <laughs> I took this very seriously so one o'clock we are ready and maybe twice a year I'm two minutes late but I'm really on time and it does make a difference and um, what I do there I prep earlier after lunch uh, make sure that all the lunch items are in the lunch box, uh, all the lunch boxes are in the backpack, hung, and toys or whatever, hats, t-shirts that lay around that they may have taken off is ready to go home. So in the end, I know we don't have to look for it. And then usually uh, a kid will be really frustrated if they can't find a certain item. So that helps. And then we line up and I have a few games that we play. I don't know, Trina, sorry, I came in late this morning. Uh, did you do the stuffy sorting? No, we did not. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, so if I have, we are already lined up. This class was really quick to line up. Uh, I saw them. I saw them by long hair, short hair, um, backpacks, no backpacks, glasses, no glasses. You get the idea. So I say, Emily and Lauren, you go in this pile uh, in this group and I and Trina are in this group and what is the difference? Maybe in this case it would be age and so they get to guess and by the end of the year uh, they're getting really good at it. It's something fun for them to do. So or we, pre or we play um, I spy with my little eye. Uh, we learn maybe some numbers. I um, count one, your number one, two, three, four, five. And then uh, I make sure they know their number. Four goes, sits down, three sits down until everybody's down. Then I call number one to get back up. Just some little games. And then, and then um, the routine is we always sing, go with love. And we have a little snake that the shining star gets to have like this. And it says goodbye to all the children in the very end. So that's daily and they love that little snake and they know the story uh, from Ananda with, I think, Elizabeth, where the snake was found outside on the playground and um, the children, instead of running or making noise, just stood really still and sent love to the snake. And the snake came and apparently came greeting every single child. And it went on for quite some while before the snake slithered away and they sang go with love. So my kids do know that story.